don't know about you, but have you ever been in a place where the people at the shop change? Where it transitions from one person to the next person? Uh, when I was working as a lot of tenant at, at, as a, at the, probably the first college leadership I worked for, it's called Bellowers. And I remember these guys in fancy suits and ties came walking around the lot. And as I'm collecting keys for the day, they're like, hey, did you know we're buying this dealership? And I'm like, well, no. You know, when you're a lot of you're the bottom guy on the totem pole. You don't know nothing. And they said, well, what do you think about that? I was like, I don't care. Am I getting fired? No. Well, then that doesn't matter. I'm still a little man's own boy. I just got you doing the same thing. <laughs> That's and when they came in, they took over. Things changed. It was different. It was, it, it, you know, at first, I will be honest, I didn't like them. It's like, one, we used to get free Subway sandwiches for lunch on Saturdays. And now we just get Papa John's pizza. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Things changed. It was different. And the ancient world, uh, there was a period of transition whenever one king would pass away and the heir to the throne would take over. And if you study history at all, you'll notice whenever the transitions from one leader to the next, it is always a violent and turbulent time. Because, let's be honest, not everybody is happy with the king, with who the king has picked to come next, so, so they do everything in their power to undermine them, kill them, and put somebody else in play. And believe it or not, when King David dies, you know, King David of the Bible, David who slayed Goliath, God, the man who was after God's own heart, when he dies, the same struggle takes place. David has picked Solomon to be the next king, but Solomon's older brother is not fond or crazy about that idea. And just to say there's some, there's some family feud that takes place, and Solomon obviously ends up on the throne. But not only does that new transition affect people within the king, not only does it affect that singular household, but understand when that king changed, it also impacted all of the other relationships that those kings had. And then, the, the, so the, David, he might have been a friend with this king over here, but what, what about Solomon? Is Solomon going to follow in that footsteps? Is Solomon going to get along with them, or is Solomon going to be in conflict? So the passage we're going to read today is kind of that moment where King Hiram of Tyre is curious about Solomon and what type of a leader Solomon is going to be. So this is 1 Kings chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. It says, King Hiram of Tyre sent his emissaries to Solomon when he, when he heard that he had been anointed king in his father's place. For Hiram had always been friends with David. Solomon sent this message to Hiram. You know, my father David was not able to build a temple for the name of the Lord his God. This is because of the warfare all around him until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. The Lord my God has now given me rest on every side. There is no enemy or crisis. So I plan to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God. According to what the Lord promised my father David, I will put your son on your throne in your place, and he will build the temple for my name. Therefore command that cedars from Lebanon be cut down for me. My servants will be your servants. I will pay your servants' wages according to whatever you say. For you know that not a man among us knows how to cut down timber like the Sidonians. When Hiram heard Solomon's words, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord God today. He has given David a wise son to be over this great people. Then Hiram sent a reply to Solomon, saying, I have heard your message. I will do everything you want regarding the cedar and cypress timber. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. So our key verse really is verse 7. Before we understand, we can get to that and figure out how it applies to our lives and how it impacts us, um, we got to stop and kind of look at the context that surrounds it. So Hiram sends his messengers to Solomon. He's, he's essentially he's checking out the new guy. Like, this guy's new. i got to get to know who he is. Are we going to be able to get be able to, to do business with him. Well, Hiram is the king of Tyre. It's a coastal town, it's the Mediterranean Sea. And they are well known throughout the ancient world for their timber. It was a type of wood that 
that didn't rot easily. It, kind of, it didn't develop like the worms, the parasites, and the bugs in it like other woods did. It was a very solid wood. And so it was the choice timber of kingdoms of the ancient world. But as you can imagine, yes, some of it they could, they could sail through the Mediterranean Sea, but some of it they had to carry across the land. And guess what? If you did that, you had to go through Israel. And also now being a coastal city and a coastal kingdom, Tyre didn't necessarily have access to wheat and, and oil and the things that the Israelites did. So part of their trade agreement with one another is that Hiram would send lump timber and the Israelites would send them wheat and other things. So, so I, this, is, this is an important friendship. This is an important discussion that's taken place when Hiram sends his messengers to Solomon. Hiram and David had been friends. But will he and Solomon be friends too? And so verses 2 through 5, it tells us that, that Solomon sends this response to Hiram. And he kind of lays out what his, his dad had hoped for, right? And, and, and if you remember reading in, in 1 Kings and toward the end of Samuel, remember David has him in his heart. He wants to build this, this temple for God. He wants to build this place for, for people to be able to come and worship God. Remember, up until this point, David, uh, or God had been worshiped in the tabernacle. This tabernacle traveled with the Israelites wherever they went. Right? They were in Egypt. They went through the wilderness. And that tabernacle went with them all over the place. And whenever they camped, that camp was, that tent was set up. That's where they worshiped God. But see, now that they had the promised land, and they had their kingdom established, there really wasn't a need or purpose to have a tent that was mobile anymore, was, it? was there? The time to come where you know this book got a permanent residence where everybody can go and we know where it's at. That was on David's heart. Remember, God tells David no because David's a man of war. Say, like, no, David, you, you've done these wars, you fought these wars just like I told you to, but you can't build my temple. But your son's going to do that. Now, when David gets told that, David just doesn't you know, go off the corner and kind of he starts making plans, he starts gathering materials, and Hiram is one of the people talks to. And so Psalm is kind of bringing up these details to recall that, those, that was conversation to Hiram's mind. And that's when Solomon lays out his plan. He says, you know, I, I am that son. I am that son who is going to carry on the work that my father wanted to start. I am going to finish it. I am going to see it through. Part of the reason why this was possible for Solomon is David had been at war with everyone. Yes, but at this point, David had pretty much, with God's help, conquered all the enemies that surrounded him. There was nobody left to fight. So he had this peace. And because that peace, and if there's one thing about war, it, it war costs money. So the resources that David wanted to devote to building the temple, for the cost of it, he didn't have. Why? Because he was paying it to go to war. The, the bodies that he would use to build the temple, they couldn't go and be the workers to build the temple. Why? Because there were soldiers in the army. They had to go off and fight. But now because there was peace in the land, Solomon didn't have to divert the government funds to fund the war machine. Instead, he could use it to build God's temple. He could use the workers to build God's temple. Uh, kind of a cool fact, this really doesn't have any point to do with the sermon, but it says, notice in verse 5, it says, so I plan to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God. Uh, he's building this temple for one, to point people to God, the God that he worships, the God of his people, the God that has set them free, the God that has led the wilderness, the God that has brought them peace in their area. So he's setting this up as a place to point people to God. But at the same time, it talks about the name of God. There's also this idea here. Is what this temple that Solomon is going to build is going to reflect the nature of the person that, that it's being built in honor of. And think about the temple when it's done, right? It's going to have to contain the holy voice. It's, it's going to be a holy, sacred place to serve a holy God. It's going to be ornate. It's going to be overlaid in gold and all these expensive, precious metals. 
And don't we sing the song, God, you are more precious than silver? Solomon's going to spare no expense. He's going he's to pour out everything into making this temple look amazing. So in verse 6, you know, so, he, so Solomon, he, he lays out the past conversation. He lays out the plan. And now he's getting to his request of Hiram. He's saying, hey, Hiram, uh, we need some cedars. We need some of that timber that you're famous for. And my workers are going to be your workers. But that's what he goes on to say. Uh, my servants will be your servants, and I will pay your servants' wages according to whatever you say. For you know that no, not a man among us knows how to cut down timber like the Sidonians. So the workers that were going to be brought in to build this temple weren't just any workers. He was having the Sidonians themselves, the one that knew this timber the best, the ones that have worked with it before. They were going to hire these outsiders, these non-Jews. They were going to hire these Gentiles to come in and help build God's temple. Why? Because they were the best. He wasn't just hiring any old person. He was hiring an expert. I mean, he's not, he's not hiring your uncle, your uncle Jeff's cousin who watched a YouTube video on how to do it to come in and build it. He's hiring the experts that actually know what they're doing to come in and make sure the work is done right. And not only that, that's what Sidonians says. I, you know what? You know, they're going to be your workers. They're going to be Sidonians. But guess what? I'm going to pay them. And I'm going to pay them what you would pay them. They're going to be well taken care of. Because this, is, this, this temple that they're coming to build is to worship my God. And he is worth the cost. So verse 7. Verse 7 is our key verse. So all this takes place. Hiram sends his messengers. His messengers come back with a message from Solomon. So 7 tells us, when Hiram heard, when he hears the message of Solomon, this, this means he and Solomon are not having a face-to-face -face conversation. They're kings. They both have their duties to do. They can't leave. So they're sending their little messenger party back and forth. Messenger parties back then are a lot different than they are now. But he hears Solomon's words. So that means his, his messenger comes back. He has this message from Solomon. And the messenger reads it to him because I guess the king can't read it for himself. He has somebody else read it to him. And he hears it. And that's what it says. And he rejoiced. This means he was excited about it. He, he received it with enthusiasm. It brought joy to his heart to read Solomon's words. And why, this is why he responds, or listen to how he responds. He says, Blessed be the Lord today. He has given David a wise son to be over this great people. In this moment, Hiram recognizes Solomon's wisdom. He recognizes that Solomon is going to follow in his, follow in his father's footsteps, and they're going to keep this friendship, they're going to work together. And you might, and as you read through Kings, you'll notice that there's going to be a dispute that arises between Solomon and Hiram. Because of their friendship, they're able to work it out and work past it. But Hiram right here recognizes that, you know what, Solomon's wise. He's not going to start a fight with me just because he can. He's going to work with me. And not only that, he's going to carry out the dream of his father, the work that his father wanted to do to worship God. Solomon is going to carry it on. He is going to see it come true. He's going to take his father's dream and make it the reality. He's rejoicing because Solomon's doing this, demonstrating his care for the worship of God. Solomon's building this temple to the Lord his God, but he's not taking the cheap way out. He 
He's using gold and silver, bronze. He's using the most expensive workers that actually know what they're doing. Because he wants the people that come to worship his God just by looking at the place where they go to worship him. They want to generate that awe-inspiring, that aspect of beauty that just overwhelms them as they enter it. So what does this have to do with you? Now keep in mind, I think church buildings are important. Okay, and we should maintain our church buildings. And I agree with the pastor that believe that the, that the church should have the nicest lawn on the block. And Brian does a good job of cutting the grass when he doesn't get on the mower and starts raining on him. Which seems to be the theme for this year. <laughs> Dr. Mike does a fantastic job with the garden now that it's beautiful. The flowers all around the facilities. It's gorgeous. And think about when you come to church, you and I, we arrive, we, we get to see the beauty of God on display through his workers and through his creation because of what they're doing. Rodney comes in and cleans for us. We get to come in and experience this clean environment to worship God because Rodney cares. We don't be distracted by the, how dirty the carpet reviews are. We're able to focus our attention upon God. Again, those things are important. That's not what this text is telling us. I think there's an element of that here, but that's not really what, what it's after. What, what it's after is tell us. The fact that Solomon makes the decision. Yes, David laid out the plan for the temple. Yes, David planned for his son to be the one that built it. But Solomon made the decision for himself that I am going to be faithful to my, the friendship my father established. I am going to be faithful to the plan that God gave my father, and I'm going to carry it out. I'm, I'm, I, am, I am going to be, I'm going to carry out the, 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 the idea of my father, but I'm not going to take the cheap way out. I'm going to use everything that he has given me, everything that I have, to worship his God, because his God is my God. Solomon made that decision for himself. So what that tells us is it's up to each and every single one of us. It doesn't matter what your age is, where you're from, how you grew up. Each and every single one of us have a decision to make, and that is we have to make a decision to be faithful to Jesus. Nobody else can make it for you. Nobody else can live it out for you. They can, they can, you can go to all the Sunday school classes you want. You can read all the new version Bible plans that you want to. You can read the Bible as many times as you want for yourself, but at some point, you and I have to make the decision to choose to live our lives faithful to Jesus on our own. And that's the type of things that scare pastors to death. Oh, because we love you so much. We want to see you succeed. We want to see you grow in Christ, but we can't do it for you. That's what scares Sunday school teachers to death because they, they love you. They, they pour their heart and their soul into getting the lesson ready and sharing God's word with you and interacting with you. But they, it doesn't matter what they say, and then they know that you have to pick up the ball and run with it yourself. So each and every one of us, we have to be faithful to Jesus. And we have to make a decision on our own. I grew up in a church where, I'll just tell you, that I was one of like 40 kids in our youth group and 10 of us accepted the call of ministry. And that, that church has a history of sending pastors out to be pastors. I mean, one of them came into the revival for us, Pastor Rob. The pastor that's serving there now is a pastor that grew up in that church, left and came back 20 years later. And as awesome as that heritage was, it doesn't mean squat if I don't choose to live up to the Jesus that called me to. Now, I'll share this story with you. This is in my notes. I'll share it. I remember one time, so I was blessed when I accepted the call that we had a bunch of retired ministers that were part of our congregation. 
And Pastor Walker gave this amazing sermon. He gave an invitation, and people responded, and the altars were filled. And I remember there were so many people, the response was so great that there wasn't, he, there was no way he was going to be able to pray with everybody that was up there. So he simply says, hey, any ministers in the crowd, would you come up and pray with people around the altar? Me being 16 years old, just accepting the call, just sat there. After the service was over, this old retired guy named um, um, Brother Whitaker came over with his little cane, poked me in the chest. He says, where were you? He called all the ministers up here and you didn't show up. It's like, I just answered the call last week. I'm not been trained yet. I don't know what I'm doing. He's like, you were a minister the second you answered that call. Stop worrying about all that and be obedient. <laughs> And that, that, that his lesson to me was, you know what, you can, yes, God's called you, but you have to live it out. You have to be faithful to the Jesus that has called you. That's what you and I have to do, each and every one of us. We have to be faithful to Jesus, and we have to make that choice on our own. But not only are we going to be faithful to Jesus, we have to be faithful to the work of the kingdom. What is the work of the kingdom? Well, Jesus tells us, and he tells us himself, it's, it's the same call that Jesus had. And Luke eight or Luke four eighteen through nineteen, Jesus says, "It says the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the free to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor." That was the purpose God sent Jesus for. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, He tells His disciples essentially, "Do the same thing." Right? In Matthew 20 and 19, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And then teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. So the work that began from the kingdom of Jesus, Jesus passed on to his apostles, and the apostles passed on to each and every generation that followed them. But here's the thing. Each and every generation that followed had to make the decision to be obedient and faithful to Jesus on their own. They couldn't get by on what the generation before them did. They had to decide. They had to make a decision to keep doing the work. Today we, we prayed over our new board members. Some of them were board members last year, but board members still. This church has a rich history. It's getting ready to be 37 years old in June the 2nd. And I'm sure you guys, some of you have been here longer than I, but you can think back to your memories as you're sitting here remembering the, the faces. They're not, they're not just names on a plaque in the hallway. They're faces. They're people that loved and faithfully served Jesus. And here you and I sit now on the foundation, on the work that they, 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 they gave their lives to. And that answering that call to be faithful, just hearing on you and I say that we have the opportunity to continue on that same work. We have to be faithful to Jesus by picking up the work that they started and carrying it on. Shining the light of Jesus. We have to keep going where it's uncomfortable. Going to those who make us uncomfortable. Because that's what the kingdom of God calls us to do. And if we're going to be faithful to Jesus, that's what we have to do. We have to do it together. Now, 
there's going to be moments where maybe you were in church leadership at one point on the board and now you're not. Maybe you were a Sunday school teacher at some point and now you're not. The decision still remains the same. I have to be faithful to Jesus even now. And maybe, maybe this season that you're in, yeah, you might not be up front like you once were. Yeah, you might not be carrying out the work like you were before. And yeah, you might be watching this new board and make decisions and do things and be like, why would they do that? You might complain that we're having an outdoor service from 29th. Why don't we have service outdoors? We have perfect to go to the air condition inside. It's like Green Bay Packers. They have, they, have, they have a technology to build a roof over their stadium. They still choose to play in the snow anyway. Still a little bit though. We'll pray for them today. But here's the thing. We, yeah, you can sit and look at what they're doing and say, yeah, it's different than the lab would do it. But here's the thing. They're doing it, you're not. I know that's harsh, I know that's blunt, I know that's right in your face, but that's the truth of the matter. They're the ones that God has called and picked for this moment. Yes, we elected them, but do you think it was by accident that they got elected for this time period? Are you kidding me? We don't see a God that does accidents. <laughs> They're doing the work, so so you guess you can choose to sit and complain, you can choose to be to, to, to be a stumbling block and try and hinder the order, or what you could do instead. To choose to be faithful to Jesus. Because let me tell you this, there is no office in the church. You can go through Paul's letters, there's not a single one office in the church that says, God has called you to be a critic of the church. That office does not exist. This is what Paul actually writes in Galatians 5. It says, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. That means you may not understand the decisions that are made. You may not understand the direction that things are headed. But instead of grumbling and complaining, God's calling you to love. And encourage and support. There's a verse in scripture that tells love covers a multitude of sins. And what I love about that verse is that word covers in the English isn't exactly the best fitting word. And actually, that word actually more closely resembles the word absorbs. Love absorbs a multitude of sins. And hey, I, I'm not saying that, that you know, the church leaders, we're going to get it right every time. Believe me. It's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, if you look at the text here, verse 6, where, 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 uh, where Solomon is you know, we're making his request to, to King Hiram, he actually is setting up a, 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 an event that's going to become the problem that undoes the kingdom of God and splits it into. Notice he says, you know, I'm going to pay your workers as my workers, and my servants are your servants. Solomon is going to work the people of God to the bone. He's going to work them hard. He's going to tax them hard. And so when Solomon dies, his son, Rehoboam, is that his name? Takes the throne? Starts with an R. Rehoboam takes the throne. The, the people are going to send their formants to King Rehoboam, and they're going to say, Hey, your dad worked us hard. What are you going to do to ease our burden? And Rehoboam goes home and thinks about it a little bit. He comes back, but you thought my dad was tough. You ain't seen nothing yet. And you can imagine how well that went over. Really poorly. <laughs> Where the 10 of the 12 tribes says, You know, we're out. Bye. 
Solomon sets that up. That, that mistake is made right here. It begins right here in the formation of the temple. He has the best of intentions to, to build God's temple. But he sets up this failure in the very beginning of the process. But he didn't see it then. They ask me, here I am, thousands of years later, looking back saying, look, Solomon messed up. He was an idiot for even trying. That would be wrong. Paul also commands us to do this. He says, 1 Thessalonians 5. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to regard them very highly and love because of the work. Be at peace among you. He calls the church to be at peace among themselves. And peace cannot happen when the church is grumbling against decisions being made over and over again. No, what has to happen is we have to choose to be faithful to Jesus. Being faithful to Jesus means we live out the call to, to complete the mission. But it also means part of Jesus' command is for us to love one another to the point where our love absorbs multiples of multiple, a multitude of sins. No, you didn't. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, I'm going to end on this point. That means you've got about five more minutes. Preacher talking, and I say, I'm about to end on this point, you've got five more But in Acts chapter 9, we know that, that that chapter 9 of Acts tells us the story of Paul's conversion. And Paul gets converted, what's he immediately start doing? He starts preaching. And he starts preaching to the Jews. And you know how the Jews respond? We're going to kill you. That was their response. And something fascinating happens. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, it says, This is immediately following where he just tells us they're going to, the Jews are going to try and kill Paul. This is what it says. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened. Well, that doesn't matter, does it? The church throughout all Judea, Judea Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened. How can they have peace when they're trying to kill one of the leaders? How could they have peace when the world was so against the message of Jesus? And this how. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. In other words, they were faithful to Jesus. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God came upon them and encouraged them. It strengthened them. It brought them together so despite all the trials and the circumstances that surrounded them. And it increased their numbers. Because they remained faithful to God. And by remaining faithful to God, they loved one another and they remained faithful to doing the work of the King. you and I, we still have the same decision to make. It doesn't matter what role we're in now, we have the same decision to make. Is, is will I follow Jesus? Will I follow Him? Will I, will, I, will I not just love Him, but will I, will I love the others that He has surrounded me with? Well, will I love those that God has put leadership over me? Will I love them despite the decisions they made, despite the things that about them I don't like, why I love them anyway. Because here's the truth. Because if you say, I have decided to follow Jesus, that's what you're agreeing to. That's what you're committing yourself to. If I just stand and we're going to close out with this old song. And 